Let's talk more about what we have heard so far. Um, with that, I will welcome in legal analyst and attorney Mark Reichel, trial attorney Misty Maris, and retired FBI agent Robert Dreek. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for being here. As you've been listening, as I have and people at home have, I'm interested in how you think the defense is doing here. Misty, I'll start with you. Yeah, Jim Griffin seems a little off today, I must say. He seems a bit low energy, like he's kind of searching for what he's talking about. I I'm not sure what that is. Perhaps it's just exhaustion. We've seen him really feisty in cross-examinations, direct examinations, and he just, he seems like a deflated balloon. But that being said, he is hitting some of the substantive points. I think he's missing the opportunity to hit them a bit harder. But specifically, the failures of the SLED investigation, incredibly important to the defense. SLED blew it at every level. The witnesses confirmed this on the stand. The protocol was not followed. And the point he's making is that SLED's failures ultimately resulted in there being exculpatory evidence that should have been a part of this case that is not because of their failures at the crime scene and, and all of the mistakes that they made. So I think that's really important, but I'm not sure how effectively he is getting that point across this morning. I'm hoping maybe later in the day he'll pick it up a little bit. Right, so they're trying to plant that seed of reasonable doubt with the jury. Robin, let me bring you in on the investigative side of this and the gathering of evidence. So a couple things that the defense pointed out. There were tire tracks the night of the crimes, the mm -hmm. crime, the murders happened. They didn't really secure that. They didn't take the proper evidence. He also said there was hair in Maggie's hands, and I've been watching this thing day in and day out. That was the first time I had heard that, and the hair hadn't been tested. They didn't take DNA from Maggie or Paul. Are those basic investigative steps that should have have happened that didn't? Yeah, no doubt. There, there's lots of failure on the investigative side on this. And, and you highlighted right there, Marnie, really well when they mentioned the hair in Maggie's hands. And actually, Alec, for the first time during the entire defense, he was actually starting to wring his hands and try to clear them non-verbally when that, was, that topic came up. What I find really fascinating, though, is their use of his drug addiction as a plausible defense to rational behavior because they're saying rational people don't commit murders to to deflect from themselves yet he's a drug addict which is completely irrational behavior that go inside with that so i find the entire defense interesting that they're using that irrational behavior to say rational people don't commit murder right and i think mark let's bring you in here because it speaks to the lie and and i've called it the big lie because until this trial happened no one, including apparently Alec Murdoch's attorneys, knew that he lied about the Snapchat video that puts him at the crime scene within minutes of the murders. And you heard Jim Griffin there say moments ago, we're left with the lie. He said, why did he lie? There, that's certainly a fair question as he addresses the jury. He said, frankly, I wouldn't be sitting here or over there next to my client if he hadn't lied. I'm wondering how that helps the defense in the eyes of the jury. He has to do it. It's a fact that will not go away. And so what he was doing was really getting some candor, some familiarity with the jury. So he's no longer an outsider. Like Missy described, Missy described earlier, you know, he was very aggressive throughout the trial. So by acknowledging this, he becomes one with the jury. He had to do it. He had to do it. I've actually done that before. I had a client who was acquitted, who I said in closing argument, he lied when he didn't even have to. But the science, the facts proved that he didn't do the crime. And I think that's what they're gonna go with here. Uh, you know, if you ask me, motive is really big. Motive overrides everything else on why we would do something. It has to be so strong, we would discard and override consequences here. I just don't see a motive. So I think, you know, this is not the question you're asking me, but my prediction is the jury is gonna take door number three. I think there's gonna be a mistrial in this case. I don't think they're ever gonna come, come to a guilt or innocence in this. So you think the hung jury, you don't think the state, if it came to that, would retry it? Well, they will retry after a hung jury in this case, believe me. Uh, this is where they learn their errors, and they usually go about filling those holes up and fixing those errors. But I, I just see that the jury is going to say, look, one, two, or three, and they're going to take door number three at the end of a long period of deliberations. And they're going to say, I think we're, we just can't come to a conclusion here. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.